Okie dokie, so here's a bit of a curious one. In here we have a laptop, hopefully. Um, I bought it as not working on eBay. And the reason I bought it was to, to show you something uh, which I find quite interesting. We'll get it out of the package and then I'll explain what the problem is and what the solution is. So here we have a Toshiba, in this case it's a Tecra 8000. Uh, so the Tecra is kind of like the upper end of the Toshiba range after the Satellite and the Satellite Pro. Uh, obviously they got their whole separate libretto thing going on as well. So this is quite a late classic uh, in that it's a Pentium 2. So it's uh, a bit later than some of the other stuff I've shown on the channel. But I'll show you what the problem with it is and then I'll explain. I'll plug this in. So uh, let's turn it on. I keep saying the word uh. So I've just pressed the power button and uh, nothing has happened. Oh, there we go. So I'm just going to zoom in so you can see this. But basically it's asking for a password. Can we turn the brightness up using the keyboard? Uh, not obviously. No, okay. So um, it's asking for a password. It's got a BIOS password built into it. Now, basically in the early days of laptops, kind of from about the late 386, early 486 onwards, era onwards, uh, laptop manufacturers starting putting BIOS protection into their laptops so that, you know, if they were lost on the bus or stolen, then the person stealing it wouldn't be able to access the device physically. But this is a time when people, users, were still quite naive and not that computer literate. So quite often the manufacturers would have a bypass available in some form or another. Um, I've got a, a Zenith that I've bypassed by shorting out two contacts on the motherboard. But the Toshiba is interesting because the Toshiba engineers actually had a dongle, a, a device that you plugged into the parallel port that allowed you to bypass any BIOS password. And um, it's interesting because it's actually a completely passive device. All it does is short a particular combination of pins out on the parallel port. And in theory, it should let you into the BIOS so you can uh, change the password. Now, I've never seen one of those for sale, um, but don't worry because we are going to fix this problem using paper clips. So I've done this before. All you have to do is cut these to the right length, shove them in the parallel port in a specific order, and we should be able to by bypass this password. Let's find out. So this does, because it's a full-size laptop, it does have an accessible parallel port. If we were trying to do this on something like the um, librettos, we'd be in trouble because they don't actually have parallel ports on them unless you've got the docking station as well. And um, this is a pretty standard um, laptop from the time in that it, it's got all the ports on the back. You've got your serial with a parallel, PS2 and VGA and this one's got uh, also a video out if you want to connect up to a, an actual physical monitor. Uh, it's not a review of the laptop so we're not going to go into details but what you need to know is that you need to be able to access the parallel port. So let's uh, have a go. What I'm going to do is I'll put up on the screen the pinout that you need to short across here. I'm also going to put out, uh, put on the screen a diagram of the pin numbering. Um, it's slightly unintuitive in that um, it pins number one to 25, okay? But, and they start on the top, but they start on the right of the top and go this way. Uh, and that's because if you're looking at the cable and you're looking in, it would then make the top left pin number one. But on the actual port on the laptop, pin one is at the top right. So just be aware of that if you're trying to do this. All right, let me just start by uh, grabbing some paper clips. So this works pretty well. You can probably make up one of these using a parallel port kind of generic adapter and then just kind of soldering it across the pins. Uh, what we're going to do is just use paper clips. So obviously paper clips have this plastic insulation on the end so we're going to have to trim them to the right length and then trim this off. 
it's helpful to have whoops it's helpful to have a pair of pliers to help you with the bending and it's helpful to have some uh, wire clippers to make you them shorter and to strip off the the insulation okay so i'm going to go through this i'm not going to narrate it all i'm just going to use the diagram that i showed you on the screen earlier on and uh, and we'll see if this works so pin one is the is one of the ones that is going to need shorting out but it's a bit of a complicated one because that needs shorting to two other pins not just another single pin so we're going to do that last and we'll do some of the others first it just makes it a little bit neater and easier So you could in theory do this with uh, non-insulated ones but because they cross over and I'm trying to make it as neat as possible um, it's better if they're insulated so they don't short across themselves. All right, <clears throat> getting the length right is quite tricky. It's a bit of trial and error. I did actually have another set of these made up from when I did this last time, but I've managed to put them in a safe position that's so safe I can't find it. So we're just going to have to remake all of them, but it's fine. It doesn't take that long. I should probably take the battery out of the laptop just in case we end up accidentally shorting anything we're not supposed to. And we'll go back to the back. So there's number one in. I think there's about seven we need to do in total. It just occurred to me, before we do any more, it just occurred to me that also on some brands of laptops, there was allegedly a generic backdoor password that would let you into uh, some of them. I've actually never had that happen to me uh, on the kind of four or five laptops I've tried. But should we just give it a go? So uh, let's just take that out. So for, it'll obviously vary from brand to brand um, and it depends a little bit. Some people allege that it depends on the BIOS manufacturer, uh, that the award BIOS has a default password, etc. Um, as that, it's never been my experience that that's ever worked. Shorting contents on a motherboard or changing a jumper um, seems to work better. So for Toshiba's, uh, there's a couple that have been suggested to try. One is Toshi 99. I'm guessing that <laughs> beat with Benzo, no? Uh, so uh, let's try just Toshi, but it's the other one that was recommended with a capital T. It's neither of those. And, and I don't think it's blank, although some people find that blank ones. So yeah, so we've tried three times and it's turned itself off. So we don't know what the password is, and it's not any of the default ones that allegedly work. As I said, in my experience, they, they never have worked. So we'll go back to, to plan A. So that's the first one going back in. Yes, we can. Lovely. Okay. Two down. A couple more to go. Again, doing this from an angle is a bit of a... makes it a little bit harder. But it means you get the best view for the camera. So if you're doing this at home, it's much easier to do it with a laptop vertical. So gravity is helping you. Obviously, that isn't going to work for the camera. So this is probably going to be a bit more fiddly. Okay, we're in. Now, of course, it's possible this may not work. That'd be a bit of a shame, but uh, it's worked for me in the past and it's worked for other people. 
So these days it's very hard to circumvent the BIOS passwords. The, they're generally stored, encrypted in a chip that's separate from uh, the BIOS or the CPU, a separate security chip, uh, and that makes it much, much harder to circumvent. But as I said in a previous video, if you've got physical access to a device, it, you've got a much higher chance of actually being able to circumvent any security, regardless whether it's hardware or software. Uh, sometimes it takes time, um, but potentially with access, nothing is safe. So we need pin 11. So that's 13, that's number 11 there, just underneath that yellow one. That's good. And then we need to get into pin two. So the trick here is making sure one ends in while you faff around with the other end. Make it two to 11. I can't remember where I first saw this. Um, I think it might have been on Vogons, um, a very useful resource if you're into your PCs, your retro PCs, that is. Some very knowledgeable people on there. Um, but I think this uh, wiring diagram is documented in the Toshiba manuals. The service manual, that is, not the user guide. And it works for quite a lot of generations of Toshibas. I've done it on Pentium class machines before. I've never done it on a Pentium 2. Allegedly it works. We should be finding out quite shortly. So you can see why I'm using insulated paper clips. Uh, they do cross over each other, so if you were just using the bare ones, they would short out. And this wouldn't work. So there's obviously the possibility of breaking your parallel port. Um, that's a risk you're going to have to take doing this. The, the parallel port isn't used by most people, so you know how big a problem is that? Uh, only you can answer that. For me, I have got several dot matrix printers that I like, um, and I do sometimes use them, although I doubt I'll be using them on this particular machine, assuming we can get it working. It's possible this dongle will have more than one purpose, so it may be that you don't actually need every single wire. Um, I'm sure when I did this before, I didn't use anything in hole 17, which is just down here. So I don't know what happens if you get these in the wrong order, whether it fries your motherboard. So obviously you should do this at your own risk. If you're doing this, make sure you've got all the leads in all the correct holes. You don't want to be doing anything to damage your motherboard. Although a lot of these in the bottom left here are grounds um, and the top right are datas. So the top left ones are status. Uh, I can't remember which ones actually carry any current, if any. I don't think any of them carry a significant amount. Anyway, back to the last two. So I've got 15 to go to nine. Okay, that leaves just one more, but the last one is the one that's a bit tricky because we need to connect three holes at the same time. Now with paper clips, that's quite tricky to do. So let me show you how I did that last time. So we've got one, five, and ten. So one's obviously at the top there, five's hidden under here, ten's just in there, so a little bit tricky. I might have to redo this top white wire just to make it more easy to access some of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one paper clip to bridge uh, one and ten, like that. Then I'm going to cut a little hole in the insulation here in the middle, like that, and attach a third, uh, a second paper clip to that to get the third connection. So there we are, I've got a kind of Y-shaped connector. So let's see if we can cram this in, but we are running out of space. But I'm in, okay. So 10 and one rent, now we need to get five in. Okay. So in theory, we are done. Should we try it out? So the laptop's a bit wobbly because I've propped it up. Just so I didn't dislodge the wires that are shoved in the back. So it didn't ask us for a password, so it's, it's at least recognised that something's going on in the parallel port. I think it's, it's partly working, isn't it? Because it hasn't come through to the password prompt. 
Okay, well, it seems I made it very unhappy. Um, it's not going past the BIOS screen, even though I've taken all the stuff out the back. So maybe it doesn't work with this uh, particular Toshiba, although I had read that it, uh, it did work. It could be that I had them in the wrong holes. I've taken them all out, by the way. Um, it could be that I had some of the patch wires in the wrong holes, but I thought I got it right. But the one thing we didn't do is that final connection, which I hadn't done last time, the 17 to 3 pin. So maybe that was the one that was needed. I seem to have left it in a slightly indeterminate state. It's not going past the BIOS. It's not giving us a password prompt either. There's no hard drive in here, by the way, so it may be actually that it's just taking a really long time to boot because it's trying to time out the hard drive. So we'll just give it a little bit longer. You could argue there's some progress because there's no password prompt. Uh, I think that would be a bit optimistic at this point. It's really quiet, by the way. I can, I can hear a fan, but only just. There's also no caddy, so I'll have to work on that. But we'll be doing a review of this machine on another day, assuming I can get this working. So, uh, I've, as you can see, I've completely rewired it. I'm using the same scheme, but uh, I've made the, the wires longer. It turned out that uh, it was a little bit easier. I thought it was going to be harder, but actually a little bit easier to intertwine all the different ones. The only one that's short is this one at the top that goes from uh, 2 to 11, I think it is. All the others I made long. It was just a little bit easier to get them in. Uh, and I had put all of the ones in that were in that diagram, even the one that I didn't think I had put in last time. Anyway, let's give it a go. As I said, it could be because it's waiting for a hard disk to time out, because there's no hard disk in there at the moment. It could be that it's not because the CMOS battery is flat. However, I would have thought it would give us some errors rather than staying on the Toshiba logo. So I've taken it apart and just like every other Toshiba, it does have the dreaded Varta uh, batteries in. So, and these have just started to leak. they have got a little bit of residue on the outside and the uh, end connector is a little bit uh, green, shouldn't be. So uh, do take those out whenever you get a chance. In terms of disassembly, it's very similar to every other Toshiba. You take out the bar across the back of the keyboard, flip the keyboard forward, there's a set of screws underneath that you access to take off the top cover and then you can access pretty much most things that you need to for servicing. Uh, the screws on the bottom, uh, there's several under the battery, there's several under the optical drive and then there's a three across the back. Uh, pretty straightforward to take apart, not, not too difficult. Some of the holes are labelled with the number four, that's because they've got the four millimetre screws in, all the other holes have got six millimetre screws in, uh, so that was pretty straightforward. And then once you've got the keyboard off, there's uh, four screws underneath here. All of them are the same length apart from one, and it's pretty obvious where they all go. So it didn't take very long to take apart. I, I won't didn't video it because it's all on the, the user guide, uh, the service manual, I should say. It was pretty straightforward. It took me 10 minutes to do the whole thing, including taking the batteries out. Uh, what it hasn't done, though, is resolve this issue. It's still waiting here at the Toshiba prompt. So it's not clear why that is, whether I have done something to upset the motherboard, whether it was doing that before, um, or whether it's waiting for a hard drive. Who knows? Okay, so what I've done is um, gone and purchased a drive caddy. So you can't just pop a normal IDE drive in here because it's got this um, interposer board. Uh, so it, it only works if you've got this actual caddy. So I'm going to put a hard drive in this and see if that helps us get through the boot process. So it just, uh, let's go right around, I think it goes this way around. So I don't have a cover for the drive bay, but we can uh, get one of those later maybe. Uh, I can't remember what size. Ooh, okay. So uh, we've got better, uh, got further I should say. We are past the Toshiba logo, so now get a bad CMOS checksum, which is entirely reasonable because uh, I've taken out the, the CMOS battery. So um, that's not a surprise. Check system, press F1 key, okay. So uh, we are definitely into the BIOS. So basically it's worked. Um, we didn't know it worked though because we didn't have the hard drive. Now I've got one of those. We can see it works. So there we go. We've proven that using 
paper clips can indeed circumvent the BIOS security in early Toshibas. Uh, we've also shown that in this particular case, you also need a hard drive present in the system for it to get past that boot stage. But uh, there you go, hopefully that was useful. Uh, we'll be using this system on another video at some point in the future. I'm going to have a little play now and see if I can get it to recognise this slightly larger uh, drive than it's supposed to be in there. It's supposed to be a 6 gig unit, I think. And I think it might be a 20 that's in there, but we'll have a look in a bit. Anyway, I hope you found the video useful. Um, please like and subscribe if you're into that kind of thing. But we will see you on the next one.